recording. Okay. Um, we're on the air. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a little bit after 2 o'clock. I appreciate your patience for starting a little bit late. Uh, today is Thursday, April 14th. This is the Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. Uh, today's uh, sole purpose is to discuss um, the educational budget and the recommendation by the school department um, and educational board. And um, just for the call to order, just to note that all the members of the Town Council's Finance Committee may, uh, members are here. We also have in attendance um, Councilor Donovan, uh, Chairman Donovan, members of the school board and um, the school department and our town manager and other citizens. Uh, if I can turn it over to uh, George and Jody Shea from the school board, maybe you can do some introductions or however you'd like to start. Uh, sure. You can start. Okay. Uh, <coughs> well, I think um, you've had the uh, opportunity to, to hear our earlier presentation or presentations, probably multiple. Um, in a nutshell, uh, the first reading created a projected tax rate increase of 3.27%, um, or that's for the uh, municipal budget as a whole. Um, we believe that that is a mission critical uh, budget in terms of the school representation there. I think um, you know, as we shared with you, there were some things that were basically in motion, and um, as some of those things are settling, uh, we would uh, like them to settle differently uh, because they are not necessarily um, uh, settling uh, for less. For example, our um, uh, our anthem rates, uh, we basically are projected at being 5.5%, which is a pretty good hefty raise uh, from where we were uh, last year, which was pretty much almost flat. Pre pretty much flat at zero. 5%. So a 5.5% uh, was uh, was a, I thought a actually kind of a fairly liberal um, uh, estimate, and as it's turned out, um, it was 8.8%. So um, so. As things settle, that one in particular, and other things will not settle yet. We haven't got debt services settled, uh, unless the manager has news about that. But um, we also are doing some uh, negotiating and so on. So um, that is becoming more and more mission critical to us. Um, and I think that uh, certainly we're interested in answering any questions that you might have. But um, I know that I, as the school leader, would like to um, <coughs> be able to say that, um, and I and I don't think it would take much to convince you that you know we've moved <coughs> from uh, what was um, in excess of a million dollars of all reasonable um, investments that should be made into the schools. Uh, one point, I think, upwards of one point two was it, Kate? About one point two million. And. Um, and we landed uh, after we did our work, and we very realistically um, hit that $590,000 line. Um, 590 is uh, is um, you know less than 1.2 or 1.3 percent of the whole budget. Um, and as other areas tighten up, for example, like health insurance, um, we've got to be able to find dollars elsewhere or um, you would presume, and I think that um, we would take the responsibility to find that in the in the um, recommendations that we've made in terms of new investments. So um, that's, I mean, in, in a nutshell, that is where we are. We can talk about any really anything that you would you would like to talk about. I know that the, that the <coughs> council is getting a lot of feedback from parents about. Uh, seventh grade sports and foreign language and so on, and um, you know we're happy to to address uh, those pieces if you would like uh, us to talk about them, and um, or we can really specifically look at any of the um, the investment pieces or the uh, education improvement plan. So it's, it's the really the pleasure of the council in terms of what you would like to talk about. I have a quick question. Um, do you have a, a rough dollar impact of the anthem change, mm -hmm. what that's looking like? It's about $150,000. It's not massive, um, and we're hoping to be able to offset with some other items, but it does sort of point to the lack of flexibility yep. in what's out there. Yep. 
so we s suddenly got really, you know, just a, it's like, ah, uh, you know, we often, um, I think pretty much. Did I say I told you so? Because I really wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so before we go too deep, um, can you refresh at the higher, um, refresh my memory because I don't have the notes here. Um, what were the four items that were still in motion? There was health, health care, debt service. <laughs> We've got property casualty insurance, which we're currently um, actually in a bid process for. So general insurance? Um, and work comp insurance. Those are the big insurances. Um, dental did come in, and it's going to make a little impact, but dental's little anyway, so uh, we're not really too concerned about that. Um, we also talked about um, personnel turnover where we've made some oh, estimates, okay, so we yeah. have retirements that may or may not occur. Right, yeah. um, and the, the, the big piece and the final piece, which we really won't know much about until the end of this month, is the teacher's bargaining agreement, um, because obviously we have to budget something in order to respond to whatever the, the negotiations um, impact is on their, on their salaries, um, but we don't really have a solid sense of where the board and, and the teachers union are going to land with that. So. so can you help just for the, I guess maybe for the benefit of everybody else out there, help us understand how do you account for that in the budget because you can't, you can't fix an amount in because you have to collectively bargain the, the contract. So how do you, what assumptions do you make and how do you make those? Do you just assume an X percentage because if you say, well there's 5% in the budget for increase in salaries, and when you're negotiating, they say, we know we have 5% in there. Or if you flat yeah. fund it or reduce it, they're going to say, you're not negotiating in good faith exactly. because you're reducing salaries before we even get to the table. So how do you, how do you deal with that? It's, it's very difficult to maintain compliance with labor laws in terms of um, bargaining in good faith, as you say, by setting parameters in a budget. It just doesn't work. You can't say mm -hmm. that because this amount is in my budget, this is what we have to work with. Mm -hmm. Um, it's illegal. So the way that we get around that is to, as you say, make assumptions. We assume that the structure of the salary tables in that contract will be similar to what they are in the expiring contract. And so the way that I've projected costs for folks is to pretend that that contract extends for another year and that uh, colas and steps will be similar to what they are today in the expiring year. Um, obviously, that's not, um, well, it's, it's not accurate because it's not real yet, but that's the best way we've figured out to do, to do that. The other piece, of course, is that we have personnel turnover, so that the person right. that I'm estimating the cost of today may not be the person who's collecting a salary in September. Right. Okay. So taking all of those fluctuations <coughs> into account, that's how we do it. Okay. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up question, kind of one for the school. And, and Tom, is it, does that, if, if the insurances are going up 8.8%, .8%, does that track with the municipal side too? Is it the same? No, it's different they're insurance di pool. Different yeah. insurance pool, okay, so there's no. And their pool <coughs> is, uh, is different uh, in that there's a retiree component um, that has a, that causes their pool to, to react differently than other okay. pools. So there's not, it's, it's just connected. Not one for one, no. Okay. We, we have there's our own also, experience. Uh, Sorry, Tom, I need to talk over you, but there's, there's also a timing issue. The town is on a July to December contract, so they know what their um, rates are going to be as they're going into the budget process, but then they have a half, of year, right. a half of year of unknown. We start the budget process not knowing, but then we have a full year of, of knowledge as of <coughs> today. So. And then the second question becomes, um, is at least maybe not in this contract, but in the contract going forward, do is the is there a fixed contribution to health insurance by by the contracts, or does it some somehow flow their their copays, their co shares flow with what happens to health insurance? The way most of the bargaining <coughs> agreements are written right now, it's a, it's a percentage. So um, most of them say that we will pay the employer will pay. 80% of the premium mm -hmm. cost and the employee will pay 20%, which means that if the rates <coughs> rise, then obviously the employer share and the employee share rise in the same proportion. So that 150, is that the, the gross change or is that? That's the gross change. So, so That's my calculation. Of, yeah, so a part of that will be absorbed by, in, as contributions, right? No, it's, that's, I'm sorry, that's no, that's the, the change to the employer's. Yeah. Cost. Oh, all oh, employers' cost. So it's employers. not the gross cost change. Okay. It's not the full cost of the change in the okay. premium. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. And had the um, <coughs> just and, and Chris is familiar with this. Had the 
um, change has not been made in some of the the, the coverage uh, um, in the um, in the previous um, contract. That number of 150 would be much larger because there would we would be working off a much you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. We would be benefit. working off a much larger base, yeah. and so that number would be even higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the benefit of anybody who doesn't know exactly what George is referring to that's listening in, we did have in our bargaining agreements in the past that we would pay 80% of family coverage for all employees if that was what they needed. Um, in the most recent bargaining agreements for all of the groups now, we have negotiated and the, the unions have um, embraced the idea of not covering spouses if they have eligibility for coverage through their own work and um, that continues to be a, a cost savings for the district. And as George said, it, if we had had this change in the percentage rate of the premiums in the old days, it would have been at least double that impact uh, that it is today. The, I think that the other point that's really important to know is it's, it's really not predictable that we would have gotten 8.8%. We could have ended up with 2.3%. Um, and uh, and uh, Tom makes a good point in that we, we basically carry with us in our experience rating all of the retirees that are still covered. And so we have really no idea, but you can imagine that retirees tend perhaps to be older and perhaps with age there's a corresponding um, uh, demand for, for more health care services. So, and, and all of that information is confidential. So we don't, we don't really, it's, it really is just um, sort of a, a shot in the dark when you're when you're trying to set those numbers. And Kate has always done a great job of of really not, you know, having us be in this position of of basically now having to to scoot around and and try to find uh, the difference. Just, just one last one, one last. One. When was the last time the marketplace sometimes can be competitive? So when you have renewals that are like at eight percent, when was the last time we've gone to the market to look at Harvard and? you know, some of the others that are in the marketplace. Is that something that... For health insurance in the schools, we would absolutely love to be able to go out to the market, and it's something <coughs> that the statutes have allowed us to do in recent years to get our loss, um, uh, our loss records. The trouble is that because everyone who's retired from teaching in Scarborough in the past 20 years is out there as part of our pool, demographically, we're not a very attractive insurance group. So if all you had were the active employees of Scarborough, we could go out and get a very attractive quote, even from Anthem. I mean, uh, there's some non-competition stuff there. But from Harvard Pilgrim, for sure, mm -hmm. Aetna, Cigna, those the big players, the trouble is that we have to bring all of our retirees mm -hmm. with us, and it makes our demographics very unattractive for other insurers. So we have discovered that um, through some studies and task forces and, and uh, and research that we're actually better off in the risk pool that we're in, which is the main uh, teachers association. So, and so the answer to your question is, as recent as last year, we were we were having conversations with the town, looking at bundling health care and so on, and only to discover that you know, kind of nobody really wants us. <laughs> not just and that's not because we're Scarborough; it's because right. it's, the, right. it's the demographic of the employee. It's because other communities are dealing with the same thing. Exactly. It's, it's the teacher the group. Teachers group, and that's <laughs> why the the risk pool that the teachers group, the MEA Benefits Trust, has been so successful over the years because they're able, as a giant group across the state, to mitigate those costs to some extent. Well, Actually, we're very attractive to the main teachers association, the main teachers pool, because we probably have a very attractive pool for that overall risk pool. Gen well, that's hard to say. And schools are a classic uh, reason that the insurance pools exist. Uh, <laughs> I think for all the reasons articulated, the marketplace doesn't isn't all that interesting. And so there's obviously a need in, in the, these kinds of affinity and risk pools make sense because it's not, it, it may be to the point that they're kind of the insurer of last resort or the only insurer available. That's why they can break on rate. So, so not to keep the gloom and doom train running for very long, but um, uh, well, I, um, do we have any indication, or do you have any indication from Augusta? That I know there's legislation on the table now for 
assisting the mill towns? Is that going to impact EPS funding this year, or where's that revenue stream going to come from? Um, Do you know? My understanding is, and you know, when we say we understand Augusta, we say that. <laughs> At That's a gloom and gloom train. At, yeah. At, yeah, talk about a gloomy train. Um, my understanding is that the intent is to add in to the EPS pool just the specific amount of money that they wish to disperse to those communities. Okay. That's they, how I they, understand they it. They so it wouldn't not, affect the um, formula. They, they will not redistribute. Okay. Money. Right. As of yesterday, the language in 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 the next year would have affected the four so-called mill towns. Uh, but it was wide enough that it could have included others in the future, mm -hmm. right. kind of with a big question mm -hmm. mark. Right. Yeah. That could have had detrimental effect to all the rest of us. I think the workaround, the compromise I heard as of this morning is that they've, um, it's limited to four and it's a one-year expiration. So they're kind of okay. sidestepping it by give the immediate relief, but let's let's worry about those unintended consequences when we have the time. Yeah, that's okay. what I heard as well. That they they don't want to set a precedent that then will impact the formula going forward. They want to solve the one year, one crisis problem yeah. first, and then think a little bit more about how that I works. I think it's a $900,000 fiscal note, so it's not mm -hmm. a huge sum of money, but I'm sure no, hugely important to those, to those four. Would be well, yeah, I, again, I just, bigger problems. Right, I just want to make sure that the million dollar reduction that we saw isn't going to end up being a million five or something after we've set somehow the budget it, and move forward. Separate, it is separate, and somehow it's specifically directed to them, so I don't expect it to be part of the run through the formula per se. Other questions? Um, I did want to ask regarding the four uh, general categories of uh, <coughs> items in motion, because um, I'm, and by the way, I'm focusing really on what are the challenges that you have in your narrative starting on page three, because they're informative. Um, do, you, do you think it's reasonable that we're going to know about um, all of them um, before the end of April or maybe the middle of, I mean, where in May? Um, I think that. Um, the property casualty insurance, I don't anticipate a huge change, and if anything, I expect it to be to our benefit because we're out to bid and we're hoping for a slight reduction or status quo. So I'm not too worried about that one, even though that one probably won't be settled until June because the bid process is long, as you can imagine. Um, the teacher bargaining, there's, I believe, a scheduled meeting at the end of this month. It's either the 27th or the 28th. And I'm hoping that once 26. those folks, 26, mm -hmm. thank you, um, hoping that once those folks have a chance to sit together for their first meeting, we'll have a much better idea of what the expectations are, what the, what the wishes and hopes are for coming out of that negotiation process. Mm -hmm. So that would be clearly well before you folks take your second reading. Um, it probably will be a little too quick for us to turn on to get our second reading to match, but um, we have our second reading on April 28. So. so right now, on our so, my pr personally, my preference is that maybe the, that the committee might understand that position before going to the full council to their second reading. So that way, we have that information before we make a recommendation. To and so right now, the schedule, I believe, our final review will be May 11. Mm. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So it sounds like that would actually work very well, so that we can kind of. Uh, filter that so that there's a final recommendation to the council for its second reading? I think it should work out well. I, um, I would caution you that it's, that's just the first meeting between right. the, the negotiating right. teams. But the, the interesting thing this year is, I don't know if you've heard people talking about the interest-based bargaining process and the fact that they're doing a different type of bargaining this year. And the, the idea behind that is that it's more collaborative, more problem-solving than the typical, you know, you make a proposal, I make a counter-proposal. Yeah. And one of the things I've heard about that style of bargaining is that it's quick, that it, it really, you know, there's not a lot of back and forth and wait and go away and figure it out, that it's actually designed to be more um, of a rapid conclusion. So that would serve us well. Right, I, and I think from our perspective, I think we would just be looking at the, what kind of impact are we talking about? Not necessarily the details behind what the agreement was, whether <coughs> it's benefits or that, or it's how much has it impacted the bottom line or, or, or either, either you know, how much negatively, how much positively, or okay. perhaps it's no change or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I think well, just and, the general. And, yeah. and I think from a, a strategic perspective, what the school leaders are hoping is that whatever fluctuations we have up, down, in between will land in such a way that we're able to manage through those and that we're not asking for anything more than what we've put on the table, but that our mission critical budget will be able to accommodate those changes. 
So out of curiosity, Tom, how, how do we balance, I mean, um, these outside, uh, outside influences like this that you have in a way no control over because if you think about it, negotiations, regardless of the style or type and even the participants, could go on much longer than one expects and therefore it impacts the schedule in which we, one, we make a decision as a committee, we forward it to the council and even when the council makes its decision, especially given the referendum date is kind of rather, um, at least the preference is that it's set in <coughs> stone for June 14th. 14th. So, if we don't have, if there isn't a decision on the negotiating side for anybody, whether it's them or, or even our own, what ha what happens? What do we send to the voters? Do we wait until it passes and then send it to the voters after it's been decided? No, I, I think the budget process needs to continue on its path. Uh, I suspect the, the school leaders would be forced to um, make some as solid a, an assumptions as they could. They'll be better informed, having sat presumably through several negotiations, uh, and then you cross your fingers. That's exactly correct. It would be a question of if we land with a contract that's going to cost us more than what we budgeted, then we look through our budget and we see what we don't do in order to make that happen because obviously collective bargaining is what it is. Um, conversely, if we are able to save some money in that situation, then good for us. We've got it to, to uh, reallocate. During the course of that I, mean, I don't think I've ever seen Scarborough go through that personally. Mm -hmm. it's, I it's just like health insurance. We, we know six months of what it's going to be, so we make an estimate of what we think the last six months will be. If, it, if we budget five and it comes in at two, that, you know, that's great for the yeah. town. If it comes in at eight, we have to make adjustments. So it's, it's we, we kind of estimate what we think we're going to need and then go forward from that. I just wanted to mention to perhaps add some clarity. Uh, the town is similarly kind of in motion with respect to debt, and the only area in question is the bond issue that you just approved at your last meeting. So um, I think it's a $3.8 million issue, uh, a portion of which is school school's responsibility. We have both um, put estimates in our, in our budget proposals, so I don't expect there will be wide swings. Um, but we'll have clarity. Uh, I think we go to sale at, on the 27th of this month, so uh, we'll report those out to you as soon as we have them. And that's the debt, that's the debt service moving piece that you're talking about yeah. earlier, right? For both. That's for the both. only yeah, uncertainty, for <coughs> the uh, interest expense for this most recent issue. Yeah. Well, in, in a sense, um, that's what a budget is. It's a guess. Best guess on what you think things are going to cost. Say estimates. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's a guess, Tom. Yours is an estimate. <laughs> it, it, it is an educated guess, all right? It's, it's, a, it's a, a thoughtful guess, but it, you know, it, it really goes to the the point that once we're given what we're given, we have to manage through it, no matter what crazy yeah. thing might arise, and you know, we we do our best to anticipate those things. Kind of, kind of on that note, can we? On page 91, kind of gives a summary of the surpluses from, you know, you know, physical year 09 through physical year 15. And if you kind of look at least year 12, 13, 14, and 15, um, there have been some pretty healthy surpluses generated from the budget process. And so, does that give you some comfort? Sort of the, the budget process you must be following is building in sort of a conservative safety net for things. Have you used the same methodology this year? So there's there's some comfort that for this 150,000, there may be something built in that that covers that. I'm I'm just looking. So, you know, in 012, we had $345,000 surplus. 13 was 759. 14 was 308. 15 was 456. Those those are pretty healthy reserves that are I built into the budgeting process. Sorry. I wouldn't say that. Um, I generally do aim for something between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars of a surplus generated during okay. the course of okay. the school year. I would say <coughs> in the budget that we've built for fiscal seventeen, we've been a little bit more uh, freewheeling in terms of what is, what is that? Yeah, what does freewheeling mean? More that means or being uh, less conservative in less our conservative. estimates okay. and making some assumptions that yes, we do generally generate some turnover savings. We do generally generate some savings, for example, you know, when we know something's going on with an energy contract. So what I've tried to do is to take into account those things. I would still hope that I would end the year with something in the two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range because if I don't I'm I'm frightened if anything comes up. Okay. 
think but, but there's some there's some cushion there for some of these things that we can't quite pin down there could by, be. by year end. Yeah, there should I guess be. There, there, there should be. There, there should could be. be. Yeah, okay. I think it's important to, to note, too, that <laughs> as a board, we've tasked Kate with really tightening her numbers. Um, we've had these conversations going on since January, and we're all well aware that, yes, that's happened in the past, but we need to really sort of tighten up those numbers and give our best estimate. And I think I could speak for Kate when she gives the 5.5 on the in, in health insurance. She does not feel comfortable about that. But it's best guess. And unfortunately, this year, what happened is yeah. her biggest nightmare. Um, not biggest. But, but not biggest. A, a, a <laughs> one, of, one, one of the many. <laughs> but I think it's important to sort of keep that in mind that this year feels different, I think, for all of us in that. We're trying to come out of the gate with less conservative estimates, okay. basically. And it's clear where we're starting. We're, right. I mean, gross expenditures are up just over 5% as compared to where we've started in the past. And that's the best way to demonstrate um, the different approach. Yeah. And I think, I think it's important for us as a finance committee also to frame the uh, fund balance discussion. We are going to be having some, some discussions about what the purpose of the fund balance is, what the need of it is, and how we're best utilizing that and best contributing to that. And I think um, I, I personally would be very cautious about assuming that there's a built-in cushion in a budget on the fund balance side of things to absorb shocks like that. I, I don't think that's the purpose of the fund balance. So I just want to make sure that we center our discussions, um, certainly in the future when the fund balance um, policies come up, how we address those and how we look at those. Um, but in terms of the operational budget, I, I, I would be very cautious to say uh, we've got a little bit of cushion in the fund balance to be able to absorb a several hundred thousand dollar hit or something on insurance or something like that. I think that's more you of said a... We need to be cautious about doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I w yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, I absolutely. think that it would be important to note that the um, Fiscal 17 budget also has a reliance on fund balance. It's got the same $425,000 built in that we are using this year. I think at the end of fiscal 16, things might be a little peculiar because we've got that uh, Wentworth project fund thing going on where we're spending money that was budgeted so that we can carry forward a large surplus into 17 and then hopefully yeah, into 18. It's 1.5 million. It's going right. to so, so I think what Peter's guaranteed to roll into next year. What Peter's talking about is really the, the ongoing operating process of generating surplus at the end of a year. And I, you know, I've said this before and I'll probably keep saying it until you tell me to shut up, but we do have the, the legal obligation to stay under our budget. We only have the authority to spend what's in our budget. So from our purposes, over $45 million, we've got to, we can't be shaving it too close or we're going to be out, out of uh, legal compliance with the statute. I would say one of the things that makes me just a bit nervous as well is going in, like one of the things that you don't see on increased expenditures this year is special education. Yeah. And that's, that's in contra, and, that, and that's the, sort of the realistic picture right now. But it's in stark contrast to what, what, we, what I see on the ground in terms of schools and needs. So um, that, that's just an, that's another piece that is really, it is absolutely impossible to predict, and it swings um, probably week to week, month to month. Um, but as we look at a, a new year and as we look at new kids coming to us, we're seeing a really large group of uh, kindergarten kids um, and we continue to see a certain percentage of kids that really have never been on anybody's radar. Um, and that, those kids seem to increase, and there is a corresponding uh, level of, of need associated with, with those, those students. So it's, um, that, uh, that's just a little, and here's another thing I'm worried about. Um, <laughs> because typically, as you saw last year, $180,000 of the new investments went, went to um, Special education, which would be which would be more typical, I think. Um, you know, Allison and Chris do an extraordinary job of really moving resources and really utilizing resources. They also have a, a gift of really picking the right resources in terms of a, a lot of what we needed was behavioral supports, mm -hmm. and they also get some really dynamite folks who not only um, are we paying.
paying for them, but we're getting really a good bang for the buck in terms of the skills and the, the, the professional skills that these folks are bringing. So um, th that's, a, that's an an anomaly in this budget, is seeing a special ed piece that is really n not increasing in terms of additional uh, personnel. Good. Other questions? Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about, I noticed in some of the capital improvements and projects that there were some things for some of the primary schools. How does that, like roofs and carpet and some other things, how does that dovetail into what sort of the longer term plans are for those schools? Just trying to balance, does it make sense to do a roofing project or so just wondering sort of what the longer term thoughts are on the primary schools. Um, I'll, I'll let Kate speak to the specific items if you have questions there, but um, the schools have done a very, very extensive um, facilities evaluation. Um, we uh, have most recently paused some of that work because we really needed to dig in very deeply to the projections on enrollment. And you've seen some of what I've shared mm -hmm. up on the screen and so on uh, with this new Housing Start um, model of, of projecting enrollment. Um, behind that system is basically has captured every uh, level of service, um, every system that we have in our facilities, roofing and, and heating and, and you name it, ventilation, so on. Um, and, um, and, and I think that um, the, the details that are there in combination with some of what we know about enrollment is saying that we cannot really delay in investing in all three of those small elementary schools um, because the likelihood is, the likelihood of taking any one of them offline, in my view, in the next at least few years, is would not make would not make good sense. And at one point, we were really we were really moving towards that. We ran seven different scenarios of of how to utilize buildings differently, even even switching grade level configurations and so on. And we, we ran the gamut on those. We basically knocked out anything that had anything to do with new uh, construction because we figured that the appetite for new construction at the schools, even the beautiful new Wentworth, had, had <laughs> been satiated at least for a little while and that we would um, maybe have our, our chance back at the trough in years to come, but not, not immediately. So we took a number of those things off. And, and when we looked, and, and again, this is in some ways telling um, or, or uh, previewing what uh, we're going to be spending some time with the board doing, but it's important for you to know, what we're going to be previewing is that the enrollment and the systems piece really tell us as a long-range facilities planning group that it is really best to, to continue to make some investments in those schools because they are likely going to be utilized for a while. And, um, so that, that sort of maybe gives you a more general sense of, of the work that we've done. Like I said, it's a pretty impressive study, and so uh, you know we will share with the um, the, the council when when that the uh, the rollout is in terms of all of the findings and all of the scenarios that we ran and so on with the board because I think you might find it to be of interest. I thought we were going to probably be going one direction in the direction of perhaps thinking about um, closing one of those small schools and I just don't see that at all. If I could if I could also kind of comment, I know Tom said in uh, a little bit on the initiation of this process when I was on the school board and I've, I've tried to bring it through on the municipal side, pull through as well, and I apologize, I always get the name of the organization, I always want to call them Woodward and Curran because they're the only engineering group I know in Portland, but what was the group that did the did the evaluation piece on the facilities? Param and Associates. Param and Associates. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Paramount. Right. Sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a it's it's a it's a fantastic model. One I think that we could learn a lot from on the municipal side as well. So I, I know the the details from an engineering and facilities uh, infrastructure piece that went into it. Um, it's a great plan maintenance tool. I'd love to see us almost kind of take that carbon copy, if you will, and adopt it on the municipal side because I do think that they'll that will allow us to better project and predict long-term facility maintenance and planning overall uh, across the district and across the, the, the town. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned about the, the, uh, the data that goes into it. I thought it was very well thought out and very, uh, very well constructed and almost to the point where I think you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. I think we should look at that on the, on the town side as well. Peter, I gave you the sort of the global overview 
answer. I don't know if you have specific questions about items that Kate could really address that she, she's worked with Todd on on itemizing all of what's in the capital. No, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I guess the only 30,000 mile view would just be, you know, it sounded like you're saying it, it's a five year plus probably cycle before we <clears throat> get to doing anything significant about consolidating schools or changing them. It's sort of, I, th I thought there was something sooner on that the was coming horizon. on well, the horizon, and, and much so like you we. described. So did we. I mean, when <clears throat> we first went into this process, we went into it with the thought that we were having declining enrollment and that it would be a potential cost savings to be able to <clears throat> consolidate perhaps three K-2 schools into two. And so we did defer a number of things. We didn't do some boiler repairs. We didn't do some security stuff. You know, we did the things that we needed to keep moving along, but we, we waited for mm -hmm. that slightly better enrollment data. Um, I think it's better. It makes sense. Um, but so since the time when we said this is the direction we're moving in and in public meetings, and Dan did a great presentation about that, mm -hmm. we've now moved in a completely different direction and said, wow, we really can't afford to take one of these schools offline right now until we know for a fact that those enrollment predictions are, are accurate. Mm -hmm. So that takes us back to continuing to maintain all of those facilities. Um, and so I don't think you'll see any super um, large scale projects. Um, one of the things I would mention about the HVAC, which is the heating, cooling, um, systems at K2 is that we're really hoping, and I don't know, maybe you guys can influence this, that we can get natural gas down to the K2 neighborhoods um, because that would be a huge savings. Those, those guys are all on, uh, on wow. fuel oil. And um, so Todd's kind of keeping the boiler plants going in those buildings in hopes that natural gas pipelines will spread through the town and that uh, that would be an opportunity to upgrade the heating systems. Um, but again, it's, it's really that shift, Peter, from we probably don't want to invest here to, oh gosh, we really do need to keep doing this and we do need to do this maintenance. In, in Todd's budget for this current year showed exactly what you were saying. I think he sort of held back slightly yeah. in this current year to sort of say, before we invest in a roof, let's really figure out where are we moving, where are things going with these three schools. So, yeah. He did sort of back off for a while, but well, there were two. Like, yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. There were two, there were two factors there. Last year's facilities CIP budget was quite small, and there were two reasons for that. One was because we were trying to keep our um, eyes on that long-range plan and find out where we were going to get the best bag bang for the buck. But the other was in order to not overburden the community because of the high school laptop proposal. Mm -hmm. the, it, in l last year's budget process, we gave the front and stage to technology and facilities kind of took a back seat. So now you'll see in CIP this year that it's kind of flipped back the other way. Well, but, we, but we were we were definitely looking at some of the alternatives about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we looked at a variety of possibilities. So it's interesting that in this short time, here you know, we are back the next winter and saying, well, now it doesn't look like that. Doesn't look that would have been, you know, we're thinking about a, diff a few different scenarios. Um, but in, addi in addition to that thought, I just want to say that it seems like it's a really good idea for the council to be aware through Todd Jepson, I would think, in whatever you know access you want to give them to you or Tom or whatever, a little more, you know, updating maybe once a year where he comes to say what's going on in terms of that because it impacts that capital budget and it would be nice for you, the council, to have the broader picture, not just what the municipal side has, but the full picture of all the possibilities of what may end up in that budget. Yeah, I think, you know, part of what we, our goal this year too was to improve communication so we can get the budgets passed the first time through. Right. So I think there is maybe that perception also in the community that the schools may have been headed one way and now you mm. reevaluate it. So just something for us to think about as we put together the talking points, we may want to just kind of update mm. the community on what we're thinking and why we're thinking <coughs> it and mm. how we move and those types of things. So just trying to complete the story. I think it's important though to, um, even if you are starting long range planning out a little bit further, 
should not deter us from investing in the facilities that we currently have, regardless of what their future use is, mm -hmm. um, simply because while it might transfer on the balance sheet from the school department to the town, um, we wouldn't want to have um, um, a facility that's not um, either resaleable or assumable for other services. There's always an accounting transaction that can take place that accounts for the transfer of that asset and the value of the investment that's made regardless of whose balance uh, income statement it, or expense statement it goes on. So I hope that we're not deterred from keeping up our facilities just because we may or may not change the model that we have. Well, that's a really good point too, Sean, because at one point, we even, even just you know, kind of playing around with, might there be an opportunity in a particular place to gain some money by other students coming yep. in for a particular reason to that location. So you're right, there's a whole bunch of possibility. We need to keep them up so that they could make money for us, who knows? Whether it's in the school budget or whether it's in the town budget, it's going to be in the budget. Yeah. So well, the bottom line, it's a town asset, asset no matter how right. we look at it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, other questions? Um, I, I did want to ask um, if you can highlight, um, which I think is the biggest accomplishment, and it's kind of the nerdy accomplishment as, as I call it, um, if you can emphasize the changes to the budget process that you undertook, and particularly with the presentation, um, because this is a tremendous step forward, um, which, you know, I just want to compliment, um, I, uh, you know, George, you're the boss, and it all stops at your desk, but we know that Kate's really the boss, and she's the one that did a lot of this. <laughs> now you just it's like Colette. We know Colette does a majority of it. <laughs> but I still have to live with him. I know, I know. <laughs> Regardless of who uh, gets the accolades, um, can you highlight that? Because I think it's a big, big accomplishment. So I was wondering if you can, maybe you and Joe, you talk about it. Well, I'll jump in here because... Yep. I tried to give them a compliment on it, I think at our last meeting, and I was told, whoa, 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 you know. Yes, it, it's fantastic, and I think a lot of hard work went into it, and it, I think, made this process so much easier, and it's easier for the general public to understand what's happening inside these six buildings that we call our school. So when I started down that path, they both were like, well, you need to keep in mind that we have this information. This is something. This is not new for them. It's just new in the fact that now we all have sure. it and understand <laughs> it and, and can read along. So I tried to give them a compliment before. And, and they're very helpful. Oh. But and it's not just the like a lot of I mean, we've always had the information too. Yeah. Um, it's the format, mm -hmm. and it's not just the format for us to be able to look at it, but it's also for I think very telling and very clear for even the outs any outside reader to really see the direction. Um, that we've been and where we're going. Yeah, so. and I remember last year reading the municipal side and thinking, <coughs> this is fantastic. You, you know, you don't know what's happening at Public Works. I just know they come by and plow my street every once in a while. Or, you know, so it was, it's, it's fascinating for the general public, I think, to be able to, well, maybe fascinating. It's interesting. It's a thrill a minute. <laughs> yeah, it's a page turner. But it, it's, it's important for the community to be able to read about what's happening inside our schools. I think education, we say it a lot in, in our meetings, the industry of education changes nonstop, more than any other sort of business, if you will. And so it's important for people to know how education has changed and what it looks like today versus even 10 years ago. And this is outstanding. I mean, in the past, <coughs> the, bud the budget section um, on the school department was as big, if not bigger, than the section on the rest of the town. And so I appreciate because this has been specifically consolidated into a narrative style that is similar with Tom's, where we get a v an executive level narrative of what you're doing, the basic chart at the executive level, um, and then the successes and accomplishments for each of the schools, but then also each of the departments, whether it's curriculum or development or whatever it might be. And uh, I really appreciate this. Um, I will tell you, though, that from my own personal style, there's still a lot of detail that I could do without <laughs> because I do try to look at it from the macro perspective. And, um, but this is still much, this is a great job, a great job. So I, I like to I, I can counter that a little bit because uh, you know I guess it's kind of like uh, yin and yang if you want a little bit I, I am super detail oriented 
Um, and the, the, what I like about this process is the line item is still in the back of the budget if you want to look at it. It's not yep. dumbing the process down so that it's, it's you know, keep it simple kind of thing. I think it's, it's, it's a great layered approach where you can almost stop at any level that you're comfortable with to get acclimated with it. If you start at the big picture and you, you have some questions or concerns, you can move to that mid-level. You get to the mid-level, you still have questions and concerns, you can dive a little bit deeper as opposed to having to pick either a, a broad brush stroke statement or here's 10 reams of paper to file through, you know, pick out what you want to look at. So I, I think it's a great compromise and, uh, you know, nothing's perfect, of course, but I think it's, uh, that in and of itself, I think is a great step forward for our process. Yeah. So I was going to say I am, at least that's what I tell my wife. You are what? Perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're, that's why so you're I the chair. That, sorry. <laughs> I think that um, uh, we really uh, say that the, the value of this and, and sort of, um, and what you're reading um, really comes from what the, how the team has done their work. Um, this is, this, you know, has all the things and the pieces. Um, these have all been found somewhere else. For example, no one brings forward um, a recommendation for a new investment without a full proposal. And so we've had those proposals. It's just that they've been on pages, yep. page after page after page. And then and that has become sort of the, the uh, Leadership Council's Education Improvement Plan. But it's essentially the same piece. I, and I, I do think that there's, you know, I've, re I've read the thing a couple of times, and, and, and uh, as I said, uh, we, Kate and I did some major editing in, on a lot of this to make it sound like it was written in, in one voice. But I do think that when I read it, what I saw was the cohesiveness of the budget is connected to the work. The work is connected from the K-2 to Wentworth to the middle school to the high school. Um, and, and I think that that's what, what, what people are probably most impressed with, thinking that it's the formatting, and, and really I think it's, I, I really do think it's the cohesiveness. And that's really, that, that can be done by a couple of people or a few people. It's mm -hmm. really done by a whole team, and, they, and that's the way they work. And so that's why, you know, I told them, when, we, when Kate and I gave these books out to them, we, you know, I said, you really need to take this home and not read it as homework, but re take it home and put your feet up and read it as a celebration of the work that you've done because it comes through. It's really, it's, it's meaty and it's simple, um, but, but it really reflects some, I think, some great thinking on the part of the team. Great. Um, I did have, uh, before, I, actually I forgot, I had one question about capital budgets and it is a detailed question. When, and it, I'm not going to be specific to a particular school, even though it is actually around that. Um, no, you know what, I'm just going to get to the point. Um, with, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm going to think out loud, you know, a little ADD there. <laughs> with Wentworth being a brand new school, um, looking at the capital projects, you generally will present them just district-wide with no specification to an individual school, or, which I'm okay with. The question I have is that when a new school comes on or major development in a school comes on, um, can one assume that the uh, re capital requests going forward are limited since they're not detailed in the budget because we do go out, I think it's three years. And so there is nothing in that capital budget that's specific to Wentworth School except for I think a, a tech refresh. So can we assume that because it's a new, unless of course something obviously happens, I mean we can understand that, there's nothing really planned for additions, changes. Yeah, so um, I would say Sean that the, the big kind of clumps categories of capital improvement stuff that you see in facilities, yep. it's going to be roofing, it's going to be flooring, mm -hmm. building envelope, meaning the outside shell of the building, windows, doors, walls, um, and uh, HVAC and things like that. Those are things where we really don't expect to have Wentworth have any significant yeah. needs. Yep. Um, one place that we probably will see a little bit of impact will be in continuing with movable equipment and some you know, filling of the building of spaces that haven't been properly filled. But really even that would be so minimal in Wentworth compared to other buildings yeah. like the middle school where we're trying to refresh 30-year-old equipment. Um, so I think I'm answering your question oh, with absolutely. a big yes, um, is that even though you're <coughs> seeing them in district-wide segments because there's always a piece of roofing somewhere in the district that's going to need to be replaced, but Wentworth's not going to be in that rotation uh, for the big stuff. Right. 
and we could always get down into the weeds because I know the line items are projected out there as well. Yeah. Well, and, and and I'm, absolutely. Okay. If you if you take the roofing as a good example, we have a roofing contractor who comes in every year and provides us with a five-year plan and says, you know, in the next year you're going to want to replace this section on this school and this section on this school and this one's going to need some minor repairs but it's not going to need to be replaced. They're all based on the year, the age of the, the roof and the condition and, 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 and an annual inspection. So if you wanted to know exactly what section of what building in each year was part of that capital plan, we have that as sort of the, the no. next layer down, as Chris would say. Well, the only reason for asking the question is that it impacts the policy decision that the council, I'm sorry, this finance committee will recommend as part of the budget as well as what the council has to accept regarding the use of fund balance. At least at least uh, it supports my theory behind it, so that's the reason why I've asked it. I wonder if I can ask a question about the investment, the so-called mission, mission critical investment. If I'm understanding this correct, the majority of the emphasis is at the high school. That's right. Five FTEs. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, is that a direct function of your change in schedule, which I know has been source of a lot of discussion of the, by the board and, and the administration and uh, it's been suggested that, uh, potentially is a game changer. I mean it really opens up a lot of opportunities. There, the schedule uh, is constraining or constricting uh, in the past. So how connected are these new positions to that policy decision or that schedule decision or not? Well I'd say very, very connected. Very connected. Mm -hmm. Essentially it is I said it's, it's kind of getting the high school fully into the 21st century. And that means um, providing them with the resources that we need so that we're not shutting kids out of classes um, or having classes that are of such a size that they're really not as effective as they could be. Um, and uh, providing the, the kind of enrichment that we need to in order to really get kids ready to be, um, to have the skill set that they need to go out and be successful. Um, and that would include, uh, you know, enhancements in engineering and STEM-related um, uh, pieces. But, but as well, it's also it's, it's building in, in every single core area um, and, and creating those kinds of pathways and options that kids are going to need to be successful. I think, you know, one of the statistics that I've used and, um, and you know, I'll stick by it because I've just recently recalculated, you know, when you look at the top ten high schools in, in Maine, and you take out anything that's an anomaly, like the Math and Science Academy or whatever, um, and you look at the, the kind of um, student-teacher uh, ratio that we that we have in Scarborough, uh, we are um, by far um, not even at the average of those of those other schools. Which is just one piece of data that would say, um, along with the uh, shutting out of, of, of availability of, of kids uh, taking classes that they want, um, of kids really being limited in terms of having to choose between um, staying in music or doing a foreign language or whatever it might be. Um, I, I think that it, there's a number of indicators that we have that we just really need to move the rest of the way into the 21st century, and that includes changing the schedule in the way that David is doing it and he did a, a great job of presenting it to the board, it's actually a two-year sequence. It's adding these five resources, which will immediately be a game changer in terms of, of, of getting kids into classes that they need and expanding opportunities for kids. But it also positions us with the addition of a few more positions um, in, this, in the subsequent year to really fill out that, um, that eight-period schedule that we're moving to, which, which so you, you need the resources to break that model, and you need that model to sort of uh, break through fully into the 21st century. So the decision has been made that the schedule is now going to be different starting next academic year. This this coming this coming year, 20, uh, 2017, the one that we're budgeting for, right, mm -hmm. um, is going to be different in that there's going to be um, more opportunities for kids more classes because we'd be adding the five full-time equivalents. What we would do in the next year is actually break through and make the schedule change that allows us to really fill that, that schedule out. So they are they're absolutely connected. Well, it's a good question, Tom, because I think full implementation of that 
schedule that really needs to happen. Uh, it's really going to take a two-year process, right, George? Yeah. So this is two parts that they've reduced it down. He needed 8.2 teachers. That's what he needs to implement that. Let me ask schedule. the question just a little simpler, maybe just to get to my point. I, it's my fault, not yours. So these new positions over a two-year cycle are necessary to provide those additional learning opportunities. It's not as if the existing staff can be stretched or expanded <coughs> to provide those additional opportunities within their current means. Right, right. Because, because those resources currently are maxed and the impact of those resources being maxed out is that kids are not able to do access the, the kind of classes that they want to. It's not just the schedule, it's the additional personnel to be able to provide it's teach those classes. It's mm -hmm. both. Yeah. And David has done a very David and his team has done a very thoughtful job of how much can we handle in terms of changing that high school all in one year. And and it, and I think it's also just a sort of a more reasonable way to, to propose a, a change of, of essentially adding eight eight some eight point something full-time equivalent staff, which is still probably about half the number that should be added, but it will, it, will, it will move them, it will be a game changer. I said the one-to-one -one is a game changer. This, this, this two-step process into uh, a new um, high-performing school schedule um, with the appropriate resources allocated in the right areas, the right core areas, is going to be amazing. So, last question, I promise. So with that, um, is that a precursor or, or is that suggestive of where your priorities for investment will be in 18? It's certainly, that it's certainly a preview of those three, those three point two positions will be, will be there. And, and that I would see as being a priority for sure. Thank you. So I, you, you, you all who have worked with in the past know I like to ask the five whys because you can get to the root cause of anything in five whys. So, um, Breaking down the school budget into uh, grade levels, K-2, Wentworth, middle school, high school, what area of those do you see as being the one requiring the most investment? The high school. And why is that? Because it's been neglected for a very long time. And will this improvement um, help you achieve those goals in terms of learning outcomes or is it a structural change for, uh, for a process purpose? Everything is learning outcome focused. Okay. Huge impact on the learning side for uh, not only the addition of the, those computers, but the significance of this change in schedule. It has to happen through the acquiring of these teachers. It is something that's been happening around the state. <coughs> I hate to go back and say it, but <laughs> You know, we added those computers way beyond the time they should have been added. Absolutely. And the same thing is happening with this. Because we lost all those teachers, I forget what year it was, 11 teachers or whatever, right. and we tried to do a gradual gaining of those positions back. And so what has happened in the meantime is other school districts across the state have gone to that kind of schedule, this kind of four-period-a-day schedule and the rotating schedule. That's so, so how do we how do we know that our high school is not performing as well as it could be? I think you can. I mean, you can look at the test data. I think that you know. I think that the snapshot in time that the research institutes of UMaine and USM did, um, you know, gives us a good. I mean, it's. I think it's great news. I. I, th I think. It, I, I think it basically says, look. Given where we've been, given the resources that we've used um, and had access to, the, the performance of these kids and this staff has been really quite exceptional to the point where as you rank on the basis of, of, um, of both efficiency and proficiency in terms of kids, you know, if you, you, know, if you want to include uh, the five top uh, high schools in Cumberland and, and uh, York County, um, then then there's five above us. But we're in, you know, if you want to include six, we're there. So, so I think it's I think it has really 
you know, in some ways, Scarborough has just approached it in a very different way. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it has been very conservative and very sort of slow to make those investments. And I think that on the positive side, while it can be frustrating, on the positive side, it assures that the, the resources that you have are being used very, very efficiently. Mm -hmm. You know, again, the, there's just, you know, I look at, um, I just look at the, the investment in terms of administration. You know, we are by far the lowest cost investor in terms of either district-wide or school administration. And that, that's, that's a good thing, right? Um, but we can, you know, you, we can also feel that. There is, you know, there, is, there are people wearing, all of us, wearing multiple hats. And, you know, and, and there's a rhythm there and it, and it works. So I think that that conservative approach has really maxed things out. And I think that we, you know, over the last five years, we have been e utilizing and checking the, the uh, utilization of all of those resources. And what I've been saying is we need to invest a little more, a little bit more, a little incremental piece here. And every time we've done that, we're seeing that there's changes. There's really no reason why this can't be the top performing high school in the state. So, but, but you're suggesting or really linking this, this investment we made last year in laptops and the investment we're making this year in scheduling is going to move the dial on proficiency scores. I, I absolutely do. Because, and the other thing is, I, you have to be, the rest of the system has to be ready for a change. Mm. So you can't just make investments willy-nilly because I do think that that's an inefficient way to do things. So if we, for example, the, the whole investment that has been made in the new performance appraisal system for teachers um, and the accountability. It's a, gro it's a growth planning and accountability system for teachers. Um, whether the state told us to do it or not, um, or whether they told us to do it five years ago or not, um, really makes a difference. This district was only ready to do it when we did it. And it, it just so happened to coincide with the fact that the state was saying that we had to do it. But we were ready for that investment, and I can see the change that it makes. You know, I'm out there doing evaluations using the new system, and the kind of feedback that I can give to a young new teacher now using this system versus what I would give before is, un I have to say, I'm embarrassed by the, the feedback that I would give previously without this system. So, so an organization has to be ready for certain investments. We were ready, probably over ready for the one to ones, but. But it's probably better to be over ready than not ready at all, make the investment and not really see the investment working. Mm -hmm. So, but also, I, 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 I would like to make another statement too. Um, but when you talk to our students, they're asking us for courses we can't offer. We don't have the people, and with the teachers that we have, they're already maxed out for the full week. So we can't add those additional courses. In addition to that, you know, it's not just about achieving those, you know, great proficiency scores or SATs or whatever it is. It's more about the depth and the breadth in the quality of the learning that can be gained by high schools that offer more of these courses. You've got a different student graduating, don't you? Are they both going to Tufts? Yep, they're both going to Tufts. What are they bringing with them to Tufts? that came from the high school learning. There's a significant difference there. And that's, what we're, that's to me what we're looking to achieve is that added piece of value in knowledge and growth and understanding on some other topic that we couldn't offer. So, so um, a couple of questions. One is um, we do this on the town side and, and um, there's both, um, I think, um, Benefits and maybe some challenges that it could pre uh, it could pose. Uh, what I would love to see going forward, maybe a recommendation for next year, is to have an additional section that has the what if. So we asked Tom to give us what if there is additional funding, what can we support? Whether it's uh, you know for your side, whether it's additional staff, whether it's uh, or administrative versus teachers versus whatever it might be, or another whole new program. Um, I'd love to see you know w what would another $200,000 due or 250, whatever the increments might be, it doesn't necessarily matter. Let alone, I'd love to understand, understanding that um, if, <laughs> what if the state of Maine gets to 55% funding, my understanding is that we would gain about $4 million. 
what would that do if we ever got that infusion? I'd love to be able to kind of understand that, given the environment. I'm not sure if we'll ever get to that. Um, and I wouldn't want to spend a whole lot of it, but I'd like to understand just the what if, um, whether it's in $250,000 increments up to $4 million, whatever it might be, I think that's a, a telling story about where we're going because it will take time. If anything, it will say whether we get it with the state of Maine or whether we get it through the local community, um, I'd love to hear that story because I think that would be uh, very helpful at the higher level. I'm not looking for, you know, the specific details of a particular school or a particular curriculum. I'm looking for kind of like the bigger picture, class size, whatever it might be, you know, those kind of goals. You might, you might get a, a very specific list, at least at, at up to the first million and a half or so because right. that's the process yeah. that we've yeah. backed our yeah. way out from I understand that. Right. to get to where we are today. So Kid has done, and we'll leave these with you, um, Kate has done a, a nice job. We, you know, we tried to stay away from the student um, needs-based budget because it just tends to be a lot of confusion and it, it, it um, inflates numbers and it sort of starts us off on the wrong foot. So we've, we've basically, but we've captured all of those things. And you know, if you said, um, how would you spend up instead of 590,000, how would you spend up to 1 million? Seventy-seven thousand and sixty-four dollars. We have it like right here. Um, and like I said, the first segment. This was not a stage. Right into that this one. was not a stage question. I promise. Yeah. Walked right into that one. So, um, you know, and the interesting thing, you know, just again, it's, you know, and I, I'm just really uh, proud of the team and how they really sort of um, embrace this way of doing work and improving schools. Um, they. You know, they've been very thoughtful about the, this $1,077,000. Um, they've also been very receptive to the fact that it's only going to be five ninety if it, if it stays in, intact. Um, the fact of the matter is that this list is, you know, there are, there are things on this list that have been carried for three years. Right. So we continue, this is the place that we start with our budget process next year to say, okay, so we were able to secure these pieces. What of these investments are still critically important to us. And, and I think I'd, I mean, I, I, I would concur with Sean uh, uh, to some extent on, on seeing that. What I'd like to see it incorporated, though, is eventually we get to the point where we have three and five year projections. Not, not like real hardcore numbers, but we know in three years we've talked about minimal receivership. That's someplace we want to be, whether it's three to five years. That's kind of the direction, the general direction we're heading in. So I'd almost like to get to the point where instead of having these detailed yearly um, uh, budget discussions, it's more, we should be talking more about, you know, we know where we're at right now because we've been able to plan for it, account for it. What's going to happen, you know, two, three years? And I know that's very difficult with the volatilities that we deal with from state budgets and, and things like that. But it, the whole goal, or one of our major goals collectively was predictable, sustainable, uh, incremental, um, you know, small incremental, meaningful adjustments and, and investments. And I think that would be a, a very positive thing if we could start saying things like, you know, we know at some point, not in the next three to five, but at some point in the future, we're going to look at consolidating schools. We're going to look at a new public safety building. We're going to look at getting to minimal receivership. Um, you know, how are, we, how are we building those things into, you know, not just what we're doing this year, but what are we doing next year and the year after so that there aren't surprises coming down and we're not looking at it going, wow, we've got a million dollar shortfall this year we have to react to. Um, we've already got that kind of factored in, if you will. So I, I, think, I think the work we've done jointly uh, on the finance side is very good getting us to this point. And I think to me the logical next step is once we, once we get really comfortable with this process and this interaction on the, on the annual budget level, then we can start looking into the, into the major long-term, the mid, mid and long-term planning, if you will. Um, the last question I had maybe before... Um, I had a couple of personal statements I want to make. Um, so, Dr. Entwistle, this is your last Scarborough Town Council Finance Committee meeting. <laughs> it is. He's been crying. I would have brought a I would have brought a cake, have but I would have been well. afraid that you would throw it at us. But no. um, <laughs> but I, I did I did want to ask, um, in your expert and professional opinion, mm -hmm. um, two questions. The first um, is, do you think that this budget as a whole, but, but most importantly for the school department? Um, addresses the notion that there's a cliff ahead that we may be falling off of because particularly because of the state funding piece um, and a little bit because of even local political influences however you want to kind of view your statement mm -hmm. are we addressing that properly with your budget as, let alone with the town as a whole I would say absolutely I mean it's a simple simple answer 
um, and uh, you know, for all of the things that we've talked about. I do believe that this will advance um, learning. Uh, I do believe that it is a great big, another great big step in terms of, you know, one of two steps, but um, a great big step in terms of uh, addressing the needs at the high school, which are most significant. Um, and at the same time, I do think that with the, um, with the fund balance that will be carried through and, and uh, carried forward, I think it does create a softer landing in terms of uh, becoming uh, what inevitably Scarborough will be, which is a minimal receiver from the state. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a different vision than what I sort of anticipated my last um, sort of hurrah to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more positive meaning, <laughs> what I'm saying. I don't even, uh, never mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared of what you actually anticipated. Um, so, the, so the last piece I, I want, I personally want to ask, and then I'll turn it over to you, to, um, um, any parting advice for the, at least the finance committee and even the finance committee for the school board as we hopefully continue our work together? I, I think that, um, you know, my, my sense is that we've come a very, very long way. Um, as a new superintendent five years ago, it was it was landing like on, on a different planet here, um, and and things have you know things have really become. Um, uh, I think take offense. To what's that? <laughs> yeah, you know, and I don't mean that to be uh, to be offensive. The I, aliens have embraced. It's like, <laughs> no, I think it was I think it was and really it, it was really the working together, the collaborative piece, uh, the problem solving, the. Um, the difference between being decision makers and problem solvers, and I think that we've really evolved and become problem solvers. And I, I think the, the the advice would be to, to keep going. You know, I think the schools are poised to continue to do that, um, and uh, and I think the council is as well now. Thank you. So. Good. Anything for you two? Stay tuned. Yeah. You know, last, last yeah. So last uh, before we adjourn. Um, so. Uh, George, um, I want to say thank you. This has actually been probably the two best years of a finance committee that I've had to work on um, in dealing with the school budget. And I, by the way, have lived through five different superintendents. Um, one was an interim who later became the superintendent, but very different experiences, and I think that this has been probably the um, most educational process as well as what I would call a more collaborative process that we've ever, ever experienced. And, um, I just want to say thank you for the contributions that you've made to this process because it will be, I think, the legacy that you leave behind, at least um, on the relationship side for the school board and the town council and how we work together. So I really appreciate that effort. Thank you. So, uh, with that, oh. I, I'm not ready to say my goodbyes yet. We got to. We got to. It's only on a fight, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything else? Um, Good. So I, I do want to, um, even though it's not on the agenda, Tom, do you have this calendar? Yes. Um, so um, I misunderstood, I think, what the calendar read um, yes, at the, yesterday's meeting. I just want to make sure that everyone is clear, um, and it's on the public record, um, because it's a slight change. Be careful. I don't have these are the right dates. No, I see them. Yep. Michael, I'm actually focusing with my new uh, trifocals. Um, so um, we made a clarification. So today was only the school department. There will be a meeting next Wednesday, April 20th, from 4 to 6 p.m. here in council chambers. Um, we will be discussing the library Scarborough Economic Development and Financing and Assessing <coughs> um, on Wednesday, May 4th. Take that, thank you. Oh, I'll pass it down. On Wednesday, May 4th from 4 to 6 p.m., we'll be talking um, with Community Services, um, our administration, uh, which is Tom's office, and then Public Works as well. And then um, I do want to mention, um, before I forget, there is a gap in between the 20th and the 4th, which is the most important date because on May the, sorry, on April 27th is our uh, Wednesday public forum in which um, um, school board uh, Jody Shea and I will be doing the public forum down at the high school on our budget. Um, and then the following, we are back to the budget cycle. And then um, lastly is May 11th, Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. will be our final review. Um, and that really is the finance committee's um, hopefully final recommendation. And um, I think we'll consider uh, town staff's proposals as well that evening before you wrap yeah. it up. Um, we'll also be looking at the long term, which is becoming more short term uh, staffing requests from the uh, from the town, um, and any other requests before the final approval. Uh, so that is our goal, and um, that updated schedule will be on the town's website as well. But uh, just to for everyone.
It yeah, is already so. The updated correct one? Yeah. The okay. updated corrected version. Um, any other information for the good of everyone? Okay. Ruth and I will work with George and Kate to uh, fine tune some of those items in motion and certainly mm -hmm. provide you with our best numbers before you wrap up your recommendations so you, you'll have mm -hmm. those certainly before your last meeting. Yeah. Is that right, Kate? Yeah, well, we have our school board <coughs> second reading and vote now established for the 28th, which means that we'll actually have our sort of best guess uh, on that day. It is what it is. And we'll be able to provide those bottom line numbers. Refined estimates. Is that our best refined April 28th? Estimate. April 28th is our uh, school reading. board meeting, yeah. So we should know that before this, this body is in the position weeks of weeks recommending weeks. changes to the council. And I did want to mention that next week on Thursday at 2 o'clock we have uh, we're resuming our joint uh, work uh, work sessions with the school board and town council finance committee meeting next week. Two weeks. Two weeks. That's yeah. the 28th. Sorry. Yeah, 28th. Yeah. Too, many, too many things going on. We do have an agenda already prepared. We'll distribute yeah. that. 28. So it's, 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 it's up. It's the big agenda. So. Yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you um, to you guys for coming in front of us in the more formal setting. Usually our joint sessions are a little bit more um, relaxed and casual and free-flowing. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time to come in before us in a more formal setting and answer the, the questions. I think um, it's a great opportunity not only for, for us to get some clarification, but also for the folks in the general audience and, and other people to get some good clarifications too. So. Um, Thank you for all the work we've done and will continue to do, and we're still striving for that goal of first budget pass. Man. With that, uh, move to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. We can still do this.